You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. now for the expert source for inside information on the options markets. It's time for Options Insider Radio with your host, Mark Longo. All right, everybody. That music can mean only one thing. It is Interview Tuesday once again here on the Options Insider Radio Network. The day of the week we head on out to find guests and pick their brains for the benefit of you, the listener. My name is Mark Longo from TheOptionsInsider.com, as well as, of course, in the aforementioned network. Pleased to see so many new listeners joining us week after week here. We know these are trying times out there, so it's more important than ever for you guys to have a reliable place to turn to. We like to think we fill that void. We have been doing this for, oh, coming up on 14 years now, so quite a while. So if you like what you hear, keep those reviews coming in your platform of choice. And new folks can continue to discover this program and indeed the network week after week. Of course, keep those questions and those guest suggestions coming. We do love to hear from you guys. And let's see who we're hearing from on the old Options Insider radio program today. Our guest this week is a newcomer to the program and indeed to the network. He is Tom Gallagher, the chairman and CEO over there at Miami International Holdings. Tom, welcome to the Options Insider Radio Program. Hey, thank you very much, Mark. It's great to be here. I'm uh, pleased to be able to tell you some of the things that we're up to and some of the rationale behind some of the things we've been up to over the last year or so since you and I met down in Miami. Yeah, you guys have certainly been up to a lot. We'll get to all that in a second. But first, since this is your first time here on the network, why don't you go ahead and give our audience a little bit of an overview of your background in the financial space and how you found your way to becoming the CEO over there of Miami International Holdings. Uh, so at the risk of turning off all your audience, um, so I spent 30 years as a corporate securities attorney uh, doing M&A work and also representing um, high net worth families around the world in alternative investments. And I brought the uh, opportunity of the MyX uh, story to a few family offices in the Middle East, explained to them what we were trying to do. That goes way back to uh, early 2008. And uh, we secured our first investment from a family in uh, Kuwait City in June of 08. Little did we know what was going to happen in uh, July and August of 08. So, um, we represented um, a group that came in that wanted to start a stock exchange in Miami, Florida, thus the name Miami International Holdings. And it was going to be a listings business to focus on the global Hispanic entrepreneur, whether that person was sitting in Bogota, Union City, New Jersey, Chicago, Los Angeles, or Madrid. So it was a whole different focus than the options business. But um, I decided that it made much more sense to go after the options play first and then come back to equities, which we've now gotten to with the launch of my ex Pearl equities on September 25th. That's a lot packed into that story. An interesting little pivot there. So let's, let's start there back in the early days of my A lot of our listeners will probably be familiar with my through their primary options exchange. Of course, the one that kicked it all off the, the my option, which is, is now known back in the day, it was called Miami international securities exchange, kind of hearkening back to those early equities days of their course launched. That was back in 2012. 
You launched that. Then, of course, My Axe Pearl came a few years later in 2017. And the third entry on the options side of the space, My Axe Emerald, launched about a year ago in 2019. So let, let's go back to those early days of 2012, Tom, because you kind of mentioned it had you were initially considering this in 08, 09, you know, as a one thing, catering to one very specific audience. How did the evolution and the pivot come around? You said, wait a minute. Instead of just being this uh, Hispanic-oriented securities exchange, we want to pivot and keep, keep the name, keep the branding, but instead target this, this whole options thing. How did that come about, Thomas? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so so it, it came about uh, in a number of ways. But um, in order to launch an exchange in 2012, you obviously got to start planning it several years ahead. So in 2009 and 2010, um, I looked at the pricing uh, structures on the options exchanges and looked at the pricing structures on the equities exchanges. And I looked at what a lot of the other exchanges had done. And they launched all of their options exchanges essentially off of equities platforms. And I thought, you know, why not? why not go right down main street and try and build a very robust options platform where you're trading anywhere from 1.1 to 1.3 million securities. And if you can get that right and you can create an ecosystem in the environment that we had going back to 2009 through 2012, I said, I think it would be easier to get into the equities business I'd have more wind in my sails, more uh, uh, margins. So we pivoted to go into the options world. And then I um, sought to find the best possible team to uh, build the exchange. Uh, And so about 10 years ago in February of 21, it'll be 10 years, hard to believe. I, um, I, um, you know, secured guys like Doug Schaefer, Shelly Brown, Matt Rotella, um, uh, a lot of uh, great technology people and good business people that had a good background. And I said to the guys, how would you like to, to build a, an exchange group where we don't have to have a fist fight about CapEx, where if your CEO says to you, look, you know, 4 million, um, uh, sh- you know, 4 million messages a second are fine. What the hell do we need 38 million messages? I said, you know, how about if I enable you guys to, go after some things like ultra, ultra low latency and ultra high determinism and give you exciting projects. And how often can you get a phone call that says, I'll raise the money. I'll help build a consortium of users. Um, You guys just build it. And um, so that started a great relationship over, you know, just about 10 years ago. So I pivoted to the options world. And when you look at the performance of my ex compared to the others, no disrespect to NASDAQ, SIBO in New York. When you look at our performance over the last um, you know, eight years or so, um, I think that the reason we've had so much success is we absolutely had no legacy issues from day one. We had no other constituents to, uh, to kind of um, you know, try and make compromises. And I think it's been a great, great plan uh, where we've, I think we've increased, set the bar higher. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, Mark, for me, the whole thing is about empowering your teams, keeping them you know, engaged, giving them new projects to work on, and never forgetting the most important asset in the company goes up and down the elevator shaft every day. I don't care about anything else, but it's the people. And if you forget that, you're not going to be successful. And that's why we've gone from nowhere to the 14th largest derivatives exchange group when you look at the FIA statistics uh, for, uh, you know, through June 30th. Well, it's funny you should mention you guys are coming up on your 10-year anniversary, which is crazy to me, too. I still think of you guys as the, the upstart newcomer here, Tom. How did it come to pass? It's already been almost a decade. It doesn't seem possible. Um, it doesn't seem possible. Um, and um, I can tell you, there, like in any business, the highs are real high in the beginning. The lows are low. And you hope for those days where the mounds are not mountains and the valleys are not steep, steep, steep cliffs. Um, It's possible because we've just been focused, you know, I didn't write a book about our success. I not been on 60 minutes. You guys have obviously never even heard me speak, but I've had a passion to demonstrate that even in a crowded space like multi-listed options or a crowded space like the cash equities business 
um, if you just stick to the basics, you can be successful, but it takes time. I mean, I don't know of anybody that's actually built four exchanges from scratch. Obviously, NASDAQ, New York, and SIBO have bought a lot. They've been great at integrating them. Uh, we've built four and launched four. Um, and uh, so that's taken some time. You know, you go down to the SEC, you try to get them to hear things. You, you couldn't have picked the worst year to launch a brand new options exchange than 2012. When you look at the things that happened, you know, April, BATS had the problem with their own IPO. May, NASDAQ had the issue with the flubbing the Facebook IPO. July 31st, you had the night trading situation with NYSE. And in comes the SEC a week later to give me a, effectively a reg SCI review. And they told me, Gallagher, we're going to hold you to a higher standard. We don't feel good about what's been happening in the exchange space, the downtimes, the things that have been going on. So for us to, to allow a de novo exchange group um, uh, to launch, you had better have a very high quality team. You better have a very good plan for enterprise risk management. They were there for two weeks. The guys start asking the, their team to start speaking. I'm in the front of our boardroom. The guy says, hey, Mr. Gallagher, you have an open port to the Internet. And I'm looking at the guy saying, oh, we're sunk. I've just raised 100 million bucks. These people are looking at my Internet uh, ports outside my copier. And my CIO has a Cheshire cat smile. Doug Schaefer says, Tom, these guys have been here from the commission for two weeks looking at everything. They're starting with the copiers. I think we're in a good spot. And we were. They were shocked at the maturity of our operation, the, the maturity of our risk controls, the audit trails we had created. And from that day, the relationship with the SEC changed dramatically. And we've been able to get new exchanges launched and approval orders in record time. I'm not aware of any applicant um, in my career that's ever gotten an exchange form one approved without a single amendment. We've done it twice. We did it with uh, MyX Pearl and MyX Emerald. So, and it doesn't happen because we have good lawyers. It happens because we have a great company. And when they, when they come in and they look at something, we're not, we're not catching up. We're, we're living it. Sorry for the long-winded answer, but, um, you know, the 10 years has gone quickly. But launching four exchanges, buying a controlling interest in Bermuda, signing an agreement to buy the Minneapolis Grain Exchange, um, you know, the days just kind of fly by, Mark. Yeah, it doesn't seem like that long ago. It was obviously over a decade ago when someone pulled me aside back. I think it was at an OIC conference in Vegas and say, hey, it was someone from the – he had been at the Philly and said, hey, you have to see what these guys are working on over here. It's coming down the pike in a couple of years, and lo and behold, here we are a decade plus later. And you mentioned the success. Clearly what you're doing over there is resonating, Tom. Let's just look at the options lens for a second before we get into all the other interesting stuff you guys have popping off over there. But just in September, obviously September, this year, all of 2020 has been a boon year just for the options volume metric. Obviously other metrics, pandemic, everything else, a pretty terrible year. But from the options metric of volume, it has been a pretty impressive year. The industry obviously setting new records almost every month, September, yet another one. You guys are, are kind of one-upping even that. I mean, the options industry as a whole was up nearly 70-odd percent in September this year compared to September from last year. But you guys are pretty much double that, up almost 100, 141% from September of last year, setting some new monthly volume records along the way. 36.9 million contracts going up in September, Tom, as well as uh, new levels of market share up there with nearly 14%, 13.71%. Anyone who pays attention to how fragmented and contentious the equity option space is and how people fight tooth and claw for every fraction of volume going up out there. That's, that's certainly some impressive numbers. What do you think is driving so many people to your door these days, Tom? Is it just the pandemic is rising all boats or you guys have, have something else cooking over there? Um, that's a really good question, Mark. And I think, um, you know, we, we built our exchanges for periods of volatility never expecting the volatility that we've had as a result of the tragic circumstances of the pandemic. But I told Schaefer and I told Brown, I said, guys, I want to build the most robust system. I want to plan for this, the, the, the day when the others that maybe don't feel that it's necessary or they're not good at getting budget allocations for CapEx and OpEx from their chairman and CEO, I want to plan for the day when we have – periods of high volatility, and then we can differentiate ourselves. And that's exactly what's happened, Mark, 
in the last six to nine months. The firms uh, who are interested in highly deterministic experiences have found that there's no comparison to what they're seeing on my ex. Um, there's no comparison. And so the other thing is, you know, I'm selling the ride from Princeton to Kennedy Airport in an hour. And whether that's New Year's Eve, Thanksgiving Eve, or New Year's morning, they can still get a consistent path to our matching engines and back in consistently in less than 18 millionths of a second. We're probably the only firm that, that publicizes their, their, their true speed and their latency on their website. So I think it's been the technology experience, and it's also been the, the sales desk, the help desk, know our systems because they're involved in testing use cases. They have multiple hats. There's a fist fight when the phone rings in our help desk because everybody wants to answer it and demonstrate their knowledge. So I would say it's the investment that I have fostered in technology that's got there. The other thing is, um, if it's just about technology, I think we'd be at a higher percentage. The other thing is we've got anchor tenants. We've done these equity rights programs since 2013 where we're aligning the interests of the exchange with the members. And so as I sit here today, we're at about 30% of the company is owned by member firms of either equities now or options. And so um, there's a benefit to these folks that have um, the warrants so long as the customers are not prejudiced by, by not getting best X. So I'd say it's a bit of technology and I'm not boasting because it's 10 years is a long time. And I can tell you, I was the guy that, that they were talking about at OIC who was, you know, shaking the shakes to build this, this paper mache exchange out of Miami. And, um, um, you know, there, there were a lot of difficult days and a lot of difficult moments to try to get to where we are. But I'd say it's about the technology first, the equity rights programs, and three, it's keeping the team intact. We could obviously spend the rest of the show just talking about that. But you guys, I'm not sure anyone told you, Tom. But there's a pandemic going on. Everyone else you've had on the network has kind of been talking about how they're scrambling to keep their regular day-to-day functions up and running and dealing with their staff. You guys have been out and about wheeling and dealing, including, I guess you you felt you didn't have enough on your plate in the options space, Tom, because you guys just launched uh, about a month ago uh, Myax Pearl, your your new addition to the equity space. So, Tom, what was it? You guys were tired? You thought maybe options were too easy, you thought you'd, you'd fight your way into equities as well. What prompted you guys to launch an equities exchange in a super crowded marketplace in the middle of a pandemic, sir? <laughs> yeah, you got to be a little bit nuts to even do launching uh, three options exchanges. So um, you got to be a little crazy to, to launch an equities exchange. I, I, I see opportunities. I absolutely see opportunities in periods like this where if you've got a great infrastructure, you've got a very lean infrastructure. I've got 155 people, okay? When people like Euronext or LSE come in to talk to us about joint ventures, they said, where's the other three floors of people? I said, no, this is it. So if you can build and launch and operate three U.S. markets with 150 people and add 15 to 16 to build an equities exchange and bring the technology chops that we're bringing to the table uh, honed over the last 10 years, why not, bring, why not bring that to the equities market where I can be a low-cost operator because I am not, um, you know, in a company with 600 uh, heads. Uh, our competition, as you know, have thousands. So we have an extremely low cost. We operate out of Princeton, New York, um, and uh, Miami. And so I thought we could bring our low-cost infrastructure, spread it out over another venue, and see if I could bring – create a new ecosystem around um, the things that we've been known for in options. Plus I need to be able to cross uh, asset price and I wanted to complete, I wanted to complete to to create the value for our stockholders, Mark, of of not just being um, a a one class uh, exchange group. So, so we, we, we went into the options. Now we're in equities. We're then going to get the listings uh, in the next two years. And then we want to branch out the futures because in order to make the options exchanges competitive, you've got to be able to offer some unique products and especially everybody complaining about data costs and connectivity costs and, and those kind of things. Why not bring some innovative ideas? They're paying to trade, they're paying to be members. So I thought, well, why not have a futures exchange that we can 
also used futures products to help stimulate our options uh, and equities, thus the, uh, the, uh, the Minneapolis um, uh, transaction. Yeah, you have a lot, lot on the docket in terms of, uh, of transactions. I want to get to MJX in a second, but obviously you just launched Myax Pearl. It's only been a few weeks, but uh, how have those first few weeks been so far? Are they, are they living up to your expectations? How has that initial foray into equities gone, Tom? Yeah, um, I, I, think, um, I think the foray has gone well. Look, we're, we're, the one thing I've done I think that differentiates me a little bit over our competitors, Memex and others, is – when you're launching an exchange in a pandemic, you want to be able to stick to the basics. If you give them a date that you're going to launch your exchange, stick to it. If you give them a schedule of what you're going to do and how long it's going to take you to roll out, stick to it. And for God's sakes, don't try to do anything that is too aggressive given the volatility that we're experiencing in the markets. So I'm doing a rollout between uh, the 29th of September and the first week in December, and we're rolling out uh, modestly. And so far, um, what, what am I doing? I'm getting a chance to see the functionality of the exchange with different order types. I'm getting to, to see um, more and more members connecting. And uh, so far, so good. Steady as she goes. Um, we have an equity rights program. So we have um, nine major firms that have joined the consortium. They prepaid $22 million worth of trading fees. And 40% of the units that were subscribed for um, were sold also to people that are in Memex. So they, those firms are not only in Memex, they're also in Myax. Um, and so the idea here is I've got a goal of 5.5% national volume in equities starting with uh, January 1, the program launches, and it goes for 42 months. So basically – in the next four years, if I can get 70% of my goal, I'd be happy. 3.5% national volume in equities with all the various venues, uh, I'd be happy. So bottom line is we made our launch date. We're on track with the rollout. We have not had any operational issues that are concerning me, and um, I'm pleased where I am at today. In six months, I could give you an update because I'm expecting to have everything rolled out. I expect you have a lot more going. We'll have to talk about again in six months. But that wasn't enough on the equities front. You guys also expanded on the international equities front, and you uh, acquired the Bermuda Stock Exchange. Tom, what was the impetus there? Yeah, so so um, I want to pursue other asset classes over time as well, in addition to options, equities, and futures. And I wanted to launch a, a dual digital security strategy. Chairman Clayton has said that these securities are, in fact, in many instances, securities that need to be registered. And if you have so many holders of them, then the company has to be listed on an exchange. But the problem is whatever the chairman says on the 10th floor can take three to four years for the trading and markets folks and the teams of people to come up with the rules for trading. So my approach is a dual approach where I'm going to go to other jurisdictions where possibly I could launch a digital securities exchange in a very highly regulated, uh, comfortable marketplace, um, and I can experiment a bit while the U.S. Uh, marketplace, as it relates to crypto assets and digital securities, gets refined. So Bermuda um, um, has some really unique designations. It also has one of the foremost digital securities act called the DABA Act. I went down, met the premier, uh, talked to him about our plans. Um, they really consider their exchange a national gem, and they were looking for somebody that would be a good steward, wouldn't uh, ruin the legacy of the exchange. It has a, a focus right now on ILS and debt listings, and we're gonna we're gonna um, we're gonna tune it up, and we're gonna over time put some MyX technology, and we're gonna have fun with it, and we're gonna experiment with um, initially digital, and uh, and then some other asset classes. So even though it's an equities exchange, you primarily view it through the lens of a, a digital asset or a crypto exchange, Tom? Um, I would say more on digital than crypto, um, but it's certainly something that I want to look at. Um, we also have a minority in interest in LedgerX, uh, which was the first um, you know, uh, uh, crypto uh, securities uh, firm to get a, a, the CFTC licenses in 2016 and 2017. Um, so I'm uh, looking at Bermuda also to be a place where we could put up more and more international listings 
not only of debt, but of other security types. So I'm real excited about it. It's a, it's a, it's a great company, great folks. Um, and so, um, you know, it's kind of part of my uh, attempt to become not only a domestic exchange group, but also an international. Well, you mentioned, you know, of course, obviously this is a play in the digital space. You also mentioned your stake in Ledger X. You guys also recently had a minority investment in MidChains, which is another digital asset trading exchange, I believe, focused out of the Middle East there. So clearly all things digital, all things crypto, that's clearly an area you guys see a lot of growth and opportunity going forward in. So, Tom, walk us through why you guys decided not just Ledger X and Bermuda, but also mid-chains and maybe what you guys see the opportunities being there going forward. Yeah, so so um, we obviously have about a third of our capital from folks in the Middle East, and I'm very comfortable over there having been traveling over there and know uh, – you know, know the families, know the iconic families, know the regulatory regime. And uh, we're backing uh, two young men um, uh, that started mid-chains with an, with an opportunity to, um, to diversify, but also um, see if the platform that they build for trading digital securities and, and uh, custodial arrangements with digital securities – um, if that can be something that I can use in other jurisdictions, the other thing is I have firms that are trading our traditional products that would love exposure to the Middle East. And we're working on some digital uh, securities for products that are um, focused on the Middle East, and they wanted to have exposure to that. I really can't go into which of the firms, but they knew that uh, I've had relationships and my ex has had relationships since inception to the Middle East. So it's, a, it's an attempt to, um, to also be in a region. There's incredible wealth. There's incredible wealth within you know, a two-hour flight of the United Arab Emirates, Abu Dhabi. Um, and when you look at um, the uh, Kuwaitis, the Bahrainians, the Emiratis, you know, Kuwait has a, a population of citizens of only 1.1 million people. Okay, they're they're the fourth largest producer of oil and gas assets um, on the planet. Exxon Mobil, our largest oil and gas producer in the United States, is number 24. So when you have places like Bahrain, the United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, where there's tremendous disposable income, um, you also have access to a young population that is willing to start developing um, an affinity for digital assets, crypto assets. So I want to be where there is a a great access to a population of people that want to trade alternative securities. And I wanted to back somebody, you know, our co-investor in them is Mubadala. It's one of the largest sovereign wealth funds in the world. So it also gives me an opportunity to meet the folks from Mubadala and also the uh, Abu Dhabi um, Investment Corporation. So it's getting to know some great uh, sovereign wealth funds. It's also having access to an extremely active marketplace where the participants are likely to trade digital and crypto. And uh, I also think that we may be able to share technology and no better team than the MyX team to help them solve some problems that we've already solved. So I know it's a long-winded answer, but I'm really excited about (laughs) the relationship with MidChains. And um, it's something that I think you'll hear more of in the next six months. I can tell the, the excitement certainly bleeds through there, Tom. I like it. But you were touched on earlier. You've already touched on so many asset classes and we're already coming up against it. You touched on one earlier that is certainly near and dear to the hearts of a lot of our listeners. That's, of course, the future space. You guys recently announced your plans to acquire MJX, which is, of course, the Minneapolis Grain Exchange. Many of our listeners on the Volatility Views program may know that as the listing exchange for the much-beloved, much-anticipated return of the Spikes Futures. So what prompted that acquisition, Tom? Was it just as simple as, hey, we're listing the Spikes Futures there, so we might as well make them part of the Myax family? Or how did all that come to pass? Um, so, uh, you know, everything, is, everything has a, gradual, a gradualness to it. Um, we went around looking for a home for our, our Spikes Futures product and also some other products. And I got to know the management team and the board of directors of uh, MJEX, uh, Mark Bagan, and his team. Um, and uh, the more and more um, 
we talked about opportunities for more products, the more and more I thought it would be uh, worthwhile to uh, put the companies together so that we could have a platform. Not only could the existing uh, commercial uh, grain traders and wheat traders have a place, but also we could expand um, and create a place where financial futures would have an alternative to the uh, CME and ISE. So it was, it was initially out of a need to list the spikes futures, but we got closer and closer. And, and I was really um, pleased with the interaction on the, um, on the spikes futures as we got started. And we've also been working on three or four other products. And I thought that if we want to have, um, in our case, our company, access to the public market sometime over the next two to four years, I thought it would be much more advantageous to be in the futures business in 2021 than building it from scratch and getting one of these rare assets. These are scarce. DCOs and DCMs or CCPs, as they're called, they're very, very scarce assets. Those licenses are hard to come by. It takes a while to get them through the CFTC. And I wouldn't get the credit for being in the futures business if I was really just coming to market in 2022 or 2023. So I looked at that and said, maybe we could put a strategic deal together with the MJEC seed holders. And, um, you know, we've been on a tear since we signed a letter of intent in April. And then we signed the merger agreement uh, on July 31st. We announced it mid-August. They had a shareholder vote, overwhelming support of the, uh, of the transaction. You know, I think we give them access to capital. We give them access to um, technology. And also, um, you know, we have, I've probably got 12 to 15 people working on new products. And I think that's something that is invaluable to someone like uh, the Minneapolis Grain Exchange. So I'm real excited about it, hoping to close it this year. And, and then, uh, you know, again, like Bermuda, we are going to ring fence the, uh, the existing um, you know, a uh, wheat contract and make sure that that experience gets better, doesn't get changed. Um, so we're really making a commitment to Minneapolis. It comes with a 400,000 square foot facility and uh, we're just excited about it, Mark. Speaking of excitement, since we're on futures before we wrap up here, can you give any words of encouragement or optimism to our listeners out there who are excited about spikes and are looking forward to hopefully the return in the near future of the spikes futures? What can you tell them there, Tom? Yeah, yeah. So um, um, it's something that is probably my uh, second biggest focus as chairman and CEO behind uh, finishing up the merger transaction. And I am in, I'm in constant communication with the SEC and the CFTC. And I think we're in the fourth quarter of the game in terms of getting that back up. Um, I'm confident that we're going to get it back up. Um, you know, when you try and deal with two agencies in an election year who have, uh, you know, collectively 10 commissioners, and it's a complicated issue, Bottom line is, is that I'm hopeful that this is up and trading um, by the end of the year. And um, it's just a matter of, you know, what day that will be. It's not a question of uh, will it be. So that's about as much as I can honestly say to you, Mark, at this point. That's certainly good news to a lot of our audience that we're in the fourth quarter. So hopefully we'll be talking in the near future about being able to trade Spike's futures again. Unfortunately, Tom... That music means we come to the end of our little four. We squeezed a lot of living there into 30-odd minutes. We touched on options, obviously, but also equities, both domestic and international. We touched on digital and crypto and even what's going on in the future space. Didn't even have time to touch on your investments and let's say diamonds and other markets. You guys have a lot up your sleeves. We haven't even had time to fit it all into the show. That said, Tom... If there's something we didn't leave in or maybe it's something you wanted to touch on, maybe you want to leave our audience with a little bit of a hint, a little bit of a tease of what they can look forward to coming from you guys in my acts in the coming weeks and months. Now is the time, sir. The floor is yours. Yeah, um, I think um, we're not going to we're not going to stop growing. We're not going to stop innovating. Um, I think that um, you're going to see uh, more announcements of uh, opportunities that we're pursuing inside of the next 60 days. And um, 
I'm just honored that the futures industry um, has given us this opportunity to acquire the MJEX team. And I think you're going to see some really exciting products, both on the, um, the financial futures, and also you're going to see some interesting products on the digital side down in Bermuda. So thank you very much, Mark. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you for joining us, Tom. And I also want to thank all of you out there for downloading and streaming, listening live to this fun program. Remember, it's a lot more than just interviews here on the old network. We have, of course, Education Wednesday tomorrow for all of you who want to bone up or maybe you're just getting started in the world of options. Thursday, of course, we have the episode two of the option block as well as this week in Futures Options for all things Futures Options. Friday, of course, Volatility Views with a little exchange known as MyAx, and it kicks off again on Monday with another episode of the Option Block all the way through to another interview Tuesday and another episode of Options Insider Radio. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com.